scripture reading today in God's Word is Luke 12, 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brothers to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possession. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundance harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. So be it. Good morning. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for who you are that your ways are true, that you are a just God, a holy God, and a loving God, full of grace and mercy, that it is your longing that even your enemies come to you. If they would just call out to you, they could be saved. Father, we thank you that Jesus provided that way, that he showed us how to live, and that he laid down his life for us. Father, help us to not build up treasures here on earth, but to build up treasures in heaven as Jesus told us to do. Father, do not be concerned about the things of this world, not even what we eat or what we wear, that we know that you want to give us all good things and that you'll provide those for us. Help us not to store up things in barns, Lord, but to help us to be rich towards you and towards others. We thank you and praise you for all that you do, all that you're going to do. Hallowed be your name, Lord. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I entitle this message... As in the days of Noah, what does that mean to you? Think about it a minute. My thought process has changed a little bit with time. (laughs) Does your thought process ever do that? And I think more as in the days of Noah, even when you read in Genesis chapter 6, you read about the wickedness of mankind. But as you continue to read through the Bible and you read in Peter where... Noah was a preacher of righteousness, I think more of what our world looks like today and what the church looks like today, unfortunately. They were so caught up in the things of the world that we don't have time to think about God and the things that He has told us to think of. And I did a little picture down there, and you see Noah preaching in your bulletin. And the people are just snickering. They don't care. They just have too many things in life to be consider, to, to consider God. To consider that they are created being with a purpose. And us, especially the church, knowing that we were redeemed back to a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But we let the things of this world distract us. We let Satan get a foothold. And then we don't live a life that brings glory and honor to God like it should. If you're reading, you're reading in Ezekiel. And you're reading the same message that Jeremiah gave, the same message that Isaiah gave. You're seeing an unfaithful people, a people that God even calls harlots, that says that we have been unfaithful to Him as in a marriage covenant. But we see that He is a faithful, loving God. And everything that He does is so that we will know that He is the Lord God. And that He is a good God, a righteous God, a holy God. And that we can know as Christians that the hope that we have in heaven will be, it will be a perfect place that we can reside with the Lord forever. 
What a joyous hope that we have. So if you've been reading along, if you've been reading along, I hope you've been reading along, then you should have read Ezekiel chapter 18 to 37. And if you did, Barb, you realize that yesterday was when we read about them bone, them bone, them dry bones. We're not going to talk about them bones today, though. We're going to talk about some other things. This upcoming week, you'll read through the rest of Ezekiel. You'll read Joel, and you'll start in the book of Daniel. So there is a new sheet out here for Joel and for Daniel. And we're going to talk a little bit about Joel today to give you a little bit, a bit of insight there. Joel, you'll hear the phrase over and over again about the day of the Lord. And remember in Ezekiel, over 60 times you read about the fact that God wants us to know that He is Lord. Even in times of exile, even in times of punishment, even in times when you think that God is not around or does not care about you, He is God. He is the Lord. And if you know Him personally through the blood of Jesus Christ, then you are His child on top of that. His beloved that no one can ever separate you from Him. So you know that no matter what the circumstances of this life look like, you are blessed. You are a child of God. Building on what Ezekiel said, knowing that the fact that, that the Lord God is everywhere, He sees everything, He will judge mankind. Everything that He does is so that we'll know that He's the Lord. When you read Joel, you'll see about this day of the Lord. We see it all through history. We saw it when Jesus Christ came the first time. And we will see it again when Jesus Christ returns. He will separate the sheep from the goats. He will bring His judgment. He will also bring His reward. It just depends on whether you've put your faith, your hope, and trust in Him, or you've put it into things. You've worried about storing up things in this world because that's where your hope and trust comes from. Are you worried about what mankind thinks about you? Or you worry about your health or anything else? or if you acknowledge the Lord your God and let Him direct your paths, that you fear and trust Him both, knowing that He loves you unconditionally. The story in Joel is the same as the other prophets. Repent or die. The Lord is God. God is the Lord. And He created you to worship Him. Period. Period. He doesn't have to love us. He doesn't have to care for us, but He does also. Jesus died and supplied a way that we could be right with God. But on top of that, we got grace after grace after grace because we get to be called the children of God. We get the peace that surpasses all understanding. We get joy that we could never imagine in this earth and for eternity. The message tells us to turn from our idolatry. But we don't have idols today, do we? <laughs> See, when you read through, you think there's these Asher poles and these places of worship, and you think about this child sacrifice to the, to the gods, and I don't know, I picture like King Kong where they walk the lady off the end of the bridge and she falls down, whatever. But see, that's not how our idols are today. They still exist. It's whatever you put your faith and your hope in. Whatever you spend your time in, your talents in, your money in. Think about that. I guarantee if you put any kind of thought to it, you can come up with several idols in your life. If you're not, stop and think again because you're lying to yourself. We put our faith and hope in things rather than the one who created them all and thanking Him and praising Him for it. Do we sacrifice our children to idols? Yes, we do. Because every time we tell them that this is more important and we put our trust more in this than we do in God, we are sacrificing them to idols. You probably see, are seeing this pattern if you're reading along. God should be speaking to you, especially if you're looking through the eyes of Jesus Christ at the sins of the past. You'll see that they're still present in the future. We just don't mold them out of gold or, or, so, or whatever but we spend our time pursuing these things. So I wonder if there was a prophet today speaking, Ezekiel, Joel, whoever they were, speaking to the church, what would the message to the church be? 
Would it be to repent, lay down your idols, and quit committing adultery against the Lord your God? I think it would be. Is there a remnant? Yes, there's a remnant. Is there those that are faithful, that put their hope and trust in the Lord, that aren't just singing the songs, but are truly singing from a new repentative heart? Because Ezekiel says that God will give us a new heart, will give us a new spirit. And we saw that when Jesus Christ came. We saw that the disciples who feared for their very lives turned this world upside down and the church exploded because they didn't worry about the things of this world anymore, not even death. All they cared about was proclaiming salvation through Jesus Christ. So as you read Joel this week, I'll give you a little sample. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, this is how it reads. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Return to me. You've left your first love. You're not obeying my commands. And you have to do that with your heart. These sacrifices that you're doing in the temple without the heart behind it mean nothing. With fasting, weeping, and mourning, rend your heart and not your garments. Let it tear at your heart, not tear your clothes as a sign, but tear your heart that you would sin against God who loves you so much. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing instead. God loves you and He wants the best things for you. Remember how Jeremiah said that He forms you in your mother's wombs and He has nothing planned for you that is not good. He wants to bless His children because He loves them so much. If you keep reading in Joel chapter 2, starting verse 25, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God. See that pattern over and over still? Even if He has to punish you, Even if you punish your child for wrong behavior, that doesn't stop your love for that child, does it? You love them. The reason that you punish them was to get them back on the right path so they would be obedient to you. Because what you have in mind for them are plans for them to prosper. You love them. Who ha- praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Verse 27, Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God. Same thing. And that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. Now listen to the next words carefully. And afterwards, verse 28, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. Now those words should sound familiar to you because Peter quoted those very words at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And like I said, cowardly men became righteous men of God. They boldly proclaimed the Word of God despite imprisonment despite persecution, despite death. They proclaim that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now wait a minute, I thought this coming of Jesus Christ when He came again was not supposed to be a dreadful thing. It's not supposed to be a dreadful thing. It's supposed to be a beautiful thing. But that's only if you're a sheep and follow His voice. That's not if you're a goat and you'll get separated that day. It's for His children, those who love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul, and love one another as Christ loved and gave Himself for the church. Verse 32, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, does that mean I can just say, I believe in Jesus? I believe in God? I know there's a God out there. I know that Jesus died for me. Well, 
That's why James wrote his letter that said, show me your faith without deeds. I don't believe it. Because if you do believe what you say, you are a new creation in Christ. You have that new heart of flesh. You are governed by the new spirit of the Lord that resides inside of you. You have become a holy priesthood. You are a priest with a body of believers, a royal priesthood to, ex to exclaim, to speak boldly the word of God so that others will know Jesus, so that they can put their faith, hope, and trust in Him and come back to a right relationship with God. So the things of this world won't matter anymore, and the, the disciples were, were proof positive of that. Jesus said when He first called them, leave your boats behind, leave your family behind. You're not going to fish for fish anymore. You're going to fish for people. You're going to tell them about salvation through Jesus Christ, through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So He's saying here that anyone who calls on Him for their faith, their hope, and their trust, they will truly be saved. And on that day, there won't be weeping and gnashing of teeth for them there will be a joyful expectation of the coming of the Lord. One of those two things will happen on that day. Either you will be excited to see Jesus Christ, or you will be totally lost for all eternity. So we've got a video of Joel coming up. If you haven't been here or you're not familiar, there's a uh, section of videos. You can go to their website or you can go to um, YouTube. It's Bible Project, and it goes through each book of the Bible. So we're going to pray Joel right now and let you see what's coming up for this week's reading. Poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Joel is unique among the prophets for a few. Because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings. And his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedies of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme of the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophets saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations, and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here, in chapters 1 and 2, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter 1 is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time, the locusts are being sent against Israel. And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer, and then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts, but he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes, and Joel says, The day of the Lord is dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how? To rend your hearts, not your governments, and return to your God. 
In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent. Because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoting here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts. And we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment, and that with the God of mercy there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so, in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God's Spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they could truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess. The day of the Lord, that's a theme that's here. Now I want to point out something from the video so that you understand to read and study God's Word. The video is assuming when Joel wrote his writing. We don't know. We have no idea. There's no references to kings, to time points, anything like that. could have been written anywhere between 900 B.C. and 500 B.C. But the video says that he builds upon Ezekiel. And if you notice in our reading, we read after Ezekiel. That makes sense. It works. But we don't know that. So assuming that, that's why your ESV chronological reading puts Joel right after Ezekiel. What we do know, because we saw it, see it from the past, is that God's children disobey time and time and time again. And if we are training up our children in fear and admission, admonition of the Lord, like Deuteronomy 6 tells us, and Proverbs tells us that if we train up a child in the way of the Lord, he won't depart from it, because probabilities that's the case, then we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in. We wouldn't be in a situation again and again and again in Israel where they have forsaken their first love. If we were doing that in the church today, maybe more of our young would be here instead of somewhere else. 
Maybe we would not build up our treasures on Sunday of the lake or other things to do. Maybe we would seek God's kingdom first, and then all these other things would be added to us. Do you see it all tying together there? So let's go to the end, and let's go to Revelation, and let's look at this day of the Lord, and let's see what's written in the last two chapters. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now this is a vision given to John again, the last remaining disciple of the twelve. The one who had said early in his lifetime, Hey, do you want us to rain down fire from heaven on these people? That's what he asked God if he wanted to do. And now you see him writing letter after letter after letter talking about God's love and how we should love one another. Okay? So he sees this vision. Here's what he saw. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Does that make sense, what we've been reading in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel? How the imagery there is God marrying His bride Israel which his bride would be the church later because Israel, his people, rejected him when Jesus came as Messiah. See the imagery? Wouldn't you want your spouse, your wife, to be faithful? Wouldn't you be jealous when she looked at someone else longingly? Does it make a little more sense to you? Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them, and they will be their God. Familiar words written many, many years before. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He, is, he, who, has, was, he who was seated on the throne said... I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these are the words, these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To those who thirst, to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the springs of the water of life. Remember Jesus' conversation to the woman at the well? He said that he could provide springs of living water, and she had no idea what he was talking about. Do you thirst for God's Word? Do you thirst for His righteousness? Because those to, to those who are thirsty, I will give water without cost from the springs of the water of life. Those who are victorious, and remember Jesus' words to the churches, most of them end with those who are victorious, who have overcome this world. To those who are victorious, they will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children." But the complete opposite, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all the liars. And notice I said earlier, we have idols. That makes us what? An idolater. Okay? But if we're washed with the blood of Jesus, whew, we're okay. But are you washed with the blood of Jesus? Are you a new creation in Christ? Are you loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul? And are you loving your neighbor as Christ loved? They will be consi consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Reading on in the next chapter, sounds just like what Joel just described in that video. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God into the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. And each side, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. They, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspired the prophets, sent His angel to show His servants the things that must soon take place. Now earlier I told you that Peter quoted Joel at Pentecost. I want to read that now to you. 
In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose, because something happened. <laughs> it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below. Blood and fires and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, he's quoting Joel pretty much word from word. And he's saying that what you see now is fulfilled prophecy. You can see this come true because you see men speaking and other people understanding and they don't speak the same language. However you want to say that that happened. Tongues. Let's call it, call it that. Okay? The Spirit came upon them, and they didn't fear what men said about them. They knew that their goal in life, their calling, what they had been purchased back from, was to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ. And they were proclaiming it in a way that only God could be involved. Because there were people there from every tribe, tongue, and nation that understood each other. Wow. The coming of God. But in that prophecy it also talks about Jesus' second coming. It has not happened yet, but definitely will because they saw what happened that day. These are trustworthy and true statements that Jesus will return. And Revelation says He will separate the sheep and goats. He will also bring His reward with Him. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be celebrations like you've never seen. It just depends who you are, who you belong to. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about this a little bit. He talks about it with His disciples. When they're looking at the temple, and He tells them that it will be destroyed again in A.D. 70, that happened. But He also tells them about His second coming there as well. In Matthew 24, starting in verse 30, then, you will appear, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Notice that Son of Man. If you've been reading Ezekiel, you've seen that term over and over again because God called Ezekiel Son of Man. Jesus referred to Himself mostly as the Son of Man. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the people of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. Why would they mourn? Because if they haven't put their faith, trust in Jesus by that time, it's too late. He will send His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Drop down to verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I asked you when we first started, what does that mean to you, as in the days of Noah? Does it mean that there's wickedness all the time? Because Genesis chapter 6 says the world was evil. Their inclination and thought was on evil all the time. But God found one righteous, Noah, and He told him to build an ark. And we don't know how long it took. Remember that talk when we did that? The Bible doesn't say... It may have taken him a short period of time. It may have taken him a hundred years or more. And yeah, he lived a long life, but it still took him a big part of his life to build this ark. Hebrews says that out of fear of God, he built an ark to save his family. It ties that prepositional phrase to it. He had fear of the Lord. He was going to obey the Lord and everything, but he knew that if he built the ark, if he did what God called him to do, that his family could be saved. And he put his faith and trust and hope in God, not mankind. So what were these people doing that day, as in the day of the Lord? Were they wicked? Were they just enjoying life? Well, let's read on and see what Jesus says here. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, those days, 
People were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. That doesn't sound bad to me. Does that sound bad to you? I eat every day. I drink every day. Doesn't necessarily imply that I'm drinking whatever or, or anything else. Marrying and giving in marriage, that's a wonderful thing. A thing given by God to show His love that a man would leave his home and be married to his wife and they would be one flesh. So that doesn't sound like a bad thing until you take it into perspective. Those were their idols. They cared more about those things than to hear the preacher of righteousness, which Peter says that Noah was, of the coming calamity of God's wrath. Jesus will return again and He will bring reward or wrath. One or the other. Are you hearing the warning calls? Ezekiel laid on his side for over a year telling the people to repent, but they would not. They were more worried about eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Things that were never meant to be bad things, but were never meant to be the apple of our eye, the object of our affection. Then that day came, Verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen. How could they not? God's messenger was crying out to them for years. How could they not listen to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, to Joel? Because we're too consumed with the things of this world rather than the one who created everything. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. Then they knew. And what happened? It took them all away. They were destroyed. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So listen carefully to those words. Now the next words explain what Jesus expects, starting in verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom the Master has put in charge of the servants in His household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that, for that servant whose Master finds him doing so when he returns. We have an obligation, as Paul says, but it's not to the flesh, not to the things of this world, but an obligation to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, knowing that we live in a foreign land, that we are aliens, knowing that this is not where we put our hope or our reward. But suppose, or sorry, verse 47, Truly I tell you, He will put Him in charge of all His possessions, the reward when Jesus comes. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. I'll eat and drink and marry and give in marriage and not worry about it. And he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink. <laughs> We've got it right there. With drunkards, though. The master of that servant will come on the day that he does not expect him at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Reward or wrath on the day that Jesus returns. One or the other. Depending on whether you believe and put your hope in Jesus Christ and you follow in His footsteps as a servant. Jesus was known as the, humble, the suffering servant. He gave up heaven. He didn't just give up heaven. He gave up this world. He didn't have a place to lay His head so that He could restore you back to a right relationship with God by giving up His own life. That's what the Son of Man did for you. Now, if you're reading Ezekiel, you'll notice what all Ezekiel does as an example of this suffering servant. You'll read about the harlotry of, of God's children over and over again. What you should have read this week started in Ezekiel chapter 18. In verse 30 of Ezekiel chapter 18, it says, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways. Because many of them were saying, wait a minute, we're the children of God. They were saying that the sins of the parents went on to the children and everything. And God says, I'm going to hold each one of you accountable for your own actions. Repent. Turn away from your offenses. Then sin will not, not be your downfall. Verse 31, rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit which we saw that happened at Pentecost and is still happening today. God's Spirit resides in each and every one of us. He has given us a heart that can 
feel His presence in His Spirit, that can be obedient, that can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Why will you die, people of Israel? You don't have to. Verse 32, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. But they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't know that He was their Lord, their God, even though Ezekiel wrote it down 60 some odd times. In chapter 20, that you'll find these words in verse 11. I gave them my decrees and made known to them my laws by which the person who obeys them will live. Also I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between us so they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. Now what sign? I could go on a total different sermon here, but I just want to talk to you about, briefly about it. People have asked me before, what about the Sabbath? Do we need to keep that holy today? What is the Sabbath? Does it have to be a certain day? Well, Jesus, God tells us right here what it is. It's a sign. Six days He worked. He worked to create a creation for us. And on the seventh day He rested. Did He have to work six days to make the creation? No. He set a pattern that our lives would be work. That we are here to work. We're here to work for the kingdom of God now that Jesus Christ has come especially. Jesus said, repent, just as John the Baptist said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. It's time for you to realize your life is not your own. It was purchased. It was created in the first place, but now it's been purchased back. Will you be that servant? Slave is what the word means. Will you be a slave for Christ, or will you be a slave of this world, working for the things of this world, or working for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Sabbath times are a time that God gave as a sign to know that we will have rest on this earth. We should take a day, whatever day is fine with me, <laughs> and you should take that day to spend in God's Word, to read God's Word, to study to spend time with Him, to take out the distractions of all the other things that could be snares along the way, to thank Him, to praise Him, to spend that time in His rest so that you'll realize the eternal rest that He will provide and how much greater it is than anything that you could imagine in this world so that you put your faith and hope and trust in Him rather than in the things of this world. Now that's my short sermon on Sabbaths. But they're so that we will keep that day holy so that we will know that He is the Lord our God. Verse 13, Yet people, the people of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not follow my decrees, but rejected my laws, by which the person who obeys them will live. And they utterly desecrated my Sabbaths. They came to my temple, said my name, gave their sacrifices, but their hearts were far from me. They were committing adultery in the temple where I resided. Now think about we're the temple of God now, and Jesus Christ lives in us, God in us through His Spirit. Are you desecrating His temple by not giving Him the worship that He deserves? So I said, I would, I would pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the wilderness. But for the sake of my name, I did, what would keep, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nation in whose sight I had brought them out. Also with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land that I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. Nothing to compare with what our home will be. Because they rejected my laws and did not follow my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths, for their hearts were devoted to idols. Not physical images, but what stole their heart's affection. What they fixed their eyes on instead of fixing their eyes on Jesus. What their heart was devoted to. What is your heart devoted to? Verse 17. Yet I looked on them with pity and did not destroy them or put an end to them in the wilderness. I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not follow the statutes of your parents or keep, keep their laws or defile yourself with idols, sacrificing their own children by their own behavior. I am the Lord your God. 
Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Sixty-something times we read that. Verse 21, But the children rebelled against me. They did not follow my decrees. They were not careful to keep my laws, of which I said, The person who obeys them will live by them. And they desecrated my Sabbaths. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the wilderness. But I withheld my hand for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nation in whose sight I had brought them out. Now, fast forward to Jesus' second coming. Remember His first coming when He laid down His life. In His second coming, everyone will know that He is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, because He gave ample time for His people to repent and turn to Him. Okay? Verse 23, Also with uplifted hands I swore to them in the wilderness that I would disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries, because they had not obeyed my laws, but had rejected my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. And their eyes lusted after their parents' idols. Do you see what's going on here? Does it apply to the church today? Does it apply to you? So I gave them over oh, I gave them other statues that were not good and laws through which they could not live. I defiled them through their gifts, the sacrifice of their firstborn, that I might fill them with horror so they, that they would know that I am the Lord. Here they sit in captivity. Here Ezekiel should have been priest in the temple at the age of 30. And instead, the Lord's telling him to lay down for a year, to shave himself. Oh, Upcoming, he's going to tell him that his wife's going to die. Should have read that this week too, and the video didn't even tell you about that because that's a tough subject. As you read on though, you got to Ezekiel chapter 23 and you read about two sisters. And the scripture's clear. It tells you those two sisters are the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Two sisters who are harlots, who are tramps. And he's comparing his people to them. And in the very next chapter, in chapter 24... Ezekiel gets a message from the Lord that day. He says, it's morning. And the Lord gives Ezekiel this vision and says, your wife's going to die today. The apple of your eye, the affection that you have. She's going to die today, and you can't even mourn. Now, I don't know what all that means, but I know one thing that God was saying that He spoke to me is that He mourns over His love being lost. Because, see, He didn't send His Son to die just so that you could live your life for yourself. He died so you could be renewed to a right relationship with Him so that you would understand how much you are loved by Him and that you would be faithful and loving back to Him. What greater love than a man has than to lay down his life for his friend? And yet we were even enemies when Christ laid down His life for us. I can't go on to tell you what Ezekiel felt or anything else. But Scripture says that he couldn't even mourn because God called him to this job of proclaiming repentance to His people. I cannot imagine that. Back to Acts chapter 2. I want to finish reading that day of Pentecost. Verse 37, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart because they got a new heart. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, you won't be sacrificing your children anymore to idolatry if you'll follow in the ways of this new heart led by the Spirit of God. For all whom the Lord our God will call, with many other words He warned them. He pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now the difference here is there was a response by some people. Ezekiel didn't seem to get any response. Verse 41, Those who accepted His message were baptized. 
About 3,000 were added to the number that day. Could you imagine if we had 3,000 in that one day? They did what? Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the, wonder, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They didn't worry about where their next meal was going to come from, where their clothing was going to come from. They loved one another, knew God would provide, and they used what they had to provide for themselves. Maybe you saw I had Merle read the story of the rich fool this morning. He had barns. He had plenty. God gave him more, and he said, what am I going to do with it? I am going to hoard it up myself instead of being rich to others. And God took his very life that day. This is the total opposite of what this church was doing. They didn't care about anything that was theirs. They sold everything and had everything in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions. Why did they do this? To give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day, not just on Sunday. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor for, of all the people. And what happened? The Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. That's our first example of the church, the body of Christ, us, believers, united together with a new heart and a new spirit, not worrying about the things of this world, but building up treasures in heaven. Fixing their eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of their faith. So my question for the church, this church, is are we following that example? Jesus was crystal clear in His calling and His responsibility of those who truly believed. Those who are sheep, not goats. In Matthew 28, and I'm going to start in verse 16 instead of verse 18. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee. This is Jesus' closest followers who had been trained for years. To the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But look at the next words. But some doubted. Don't worry about doubting. Doubting's normal. It'll bring you back to God if you come to Him in question. Some of the eleven doubted. Not some of the others, not some that proclaimed they were believers, not the crowds. Some of the eleven doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, He didn't say don't doubt, don't worry. He'd already told them all these things. He gave them their commission, their calling. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, that means, hey, because of this, go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples, training them up baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, how can you teach your children, let alone anybody else, to obey all of Jesus' commands if you only follow some of them? Because you pick and choose what you do. I do. That enemy one is tough to pick, isn't it, Merle? We talk about that plenty of times. That loving your enemy, that's a tough one. But it's what we're commanded to do as Christ loved and gave His life up for His enemy. And surely, don't fear, don't fret, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Nothing can separate you. When He was taken away, Luke records on in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Then they gathered around Him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Because their eyes were still fixed on the temporary. He said to them, uh, let me explain this to you. Nope, not what he said. Here's what he said. It is not for you to know. That's not your job. Your job is to be the humble servant that I set you the example for. Remember when I washed your feet? I was the least of these. Remember when I laid down my life for you? Remember when I said I am coming back to claim you? It is not for you to know the times or date the Father has set by His own authority. But, here's what you need to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After He said this, He was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid Him from their sight. Now catch this. 
They were looking up intently up in the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white came and sat beside him. And they said the same thing again. We have to be told over and over. Why are you looking up? Don't you have a job to do? I mean, that's basically what they told him. <clears throat> Verse 11, Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking in the sky? This same Jesus who has been taking, taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So go, do your job. Now, they were told to even go home at this point and wait and pray and fellowship so that they would realize even more their calling again that it would happen in 40 more days when Pentecost came, which I read you the words of Peter, which quoted the words of Joel. And the people responded and the church grew and prospered because they did not focus on things of this world, but instead focused on God's love through Jesus Christ and their treasures that they would have for all eternity. The things of this world just lost their idols, didn't they? We, didn't, we weren't idolaters. We didn't sacrifice our children to the Lord, I mean to, to foreign gods. Instead, we brought them up in fear and admonition of the Lord, and the church grew. And the things of this world that looked so shiny and bright just became trivial to being servants to God. Got me thinking about that Luke passage, Barnes. Do we even need Barnes in the first place? Now, that guy had barns, and there's nothing wrong with him. Don't get me wrong with that. But because he had barns, he fixed his eyes on those barns instead. So when the Lord gave him more crops, he said, what shall I do? I don't have enough barns. Maybe if he didn't have barns in the first place, he could have said when that crop came, what am I going to do with this to bring God glory and honor? How am I going to feed His people? How am I going to proclaim the love of Christ? So I don't know about you, but reading through all this and putting it into perspective, putting what Ezekiel said into the, to what Jesus said and commanded in that day of the Lord, which will come, made me think about, do I even need barns in the first place? Father in heaven, as we study your word, as we read through and see how faithful and how loving and kind and gracious you are, may we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our souls. May we not think of ourselves, but listen to the words that He taught us when He taught us how to pray, that hallowed be Your name, Your kingdom come, and Your will be done. May we count on Your daily bread rather than storing up things. And when we have an excess, may we feed others with it as we forgive them as You forgive us. May we be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ until He returns, boldly proclaiming Your message loving you with all of our being and loving one another as Christ loved and gave himself for us. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.